Good afternoon, uh, this being 5 p.m. on October uh, 6th, I'll call the meeting of the Public Safety Committee to order and uh, announce uh, I am uh, City Councilor Maureen Carney, Chair of this committee. Also in attendance right now is Councilor Bill Dwight and we'll be hearing a report today from the uh, Fire Department and EMS. Uh, taking minutes is Council Clerk uh, Pamela Powers. And um, we're just waiting for one other member of the committee to uh, form a quorum to take any action. So that being said, I will go ahead and jump over the uh, order of meeting. We'll uh, dispense with the, with the uh, minutes and things that require uh, action. And I'll go ahead and defer to the uh, Chief, Brian Duggan. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to start with, with dispatch as uh, Kelly has her son here. Uh, we'll see if we can have a brief report from her. I've asked her to keep her report fairly brief and just concise. Yes. Um, so I'm Kelly Bannister, Director of Communication <coughs> for the City. Um, I only have a couple of things that I wanted to just keep you updated on, um, specifically technology. Um, when we first started, we were really in the forefront of technology for dispatch. Um, and as time has passed, just with a lack of updating with our equipment, that we're at the point where we really need to get updates in there. Um, one of the things that we're looking at is replacing the fire department station alerting system, which we've been seeing is failing between the two departments. Basically, that's used for dispatch to alert um, the on shift that there's a call coming in, that they need to respond to a call. So there's one, a separate tone for ambulance, a separate tone for engines, and it's supposed to turn the lights on in both stations as well as transmit a tone and our voices over both stations to dispatch them because they don't all carry portables. So we're finding that that's starting to fail specifically um, with the Florence station. You know, here we can at least, or in headquarters, we can at least overhead page if we have a failure. But with Florence, we actually have to call, somebody's got to answer, and then they have to alert everyone else in the station. So that's something that needs to be updated. Um, the other thing is, is our radio equipment is no longer being supported by the manufacturer, uh, which is a huge problem. Um, we're seeing that it's failing. It's basically a computer, and the motherboard has gone on one of them, so we're limping along with one of the consoles. We can function with two consoles, but if another one goes down, then we are absolutely, we have a huge issue. Um, so right now I have a refresh out there, a refresh quote, and basically that means that we'll just update the software, we'll replace that motherboard and any other parts that need to be replaced. And it's about a $35,000 project, which my grant will cover. Um, but long term wise, we really need to look at replacing that radio system. So. Uh, we have collaborated with the police department, the fire department. We're looking to invite the DPW and the school department in and talking about a whole brand new radio system. You know, just technology has moved so fast and we're like in the dark ages right now at this point. It still functions, it still works, but as time goes on, we're not gonna be able to get parts for our existing system. Um, so we're looking at what, what exactly is it that we would like to have? How much are the costs? And it definitely there's going to be cost-saving measures if we can come up with the money to do this. So it'll, you know, it's going to be capital improvement a year or two out, but we now have a committee, or I'm sorry, not a committee, but a group, a working group, to look at replacing the system. Um, you know, we're talking about going digital as opposed to analog. Copper wires are not going to be supported by phone companies much longer. We also pay a fee to have the copper wires. This is an analog system. Yes. Which is reliable, because right. computers aren't right. always reliable, but you know, as water gets in the system, we're starting to get static and we're getting failure between the two, between um, the radio towers. Um, so those are some things that we really need to look at upgrading and fixing. When you tone out, do you require an affirmation or a message received? Is that is there a way of knowing if you if you do have a, a, a dispatch failure, say in Florence? And we have a button that is in the Florence station and headquarters, and as crews go down to their apparatus, they hit it, and it will, it'll show that they've, they've acknowledged it. Okay. Yes, and we also have a camera system, so we can see if they're actually in the camera. Moving, yeah. Yeah. It's okay. That's um, so there is that backup <coughs> as well, but if, if it's busy, if it's a hot call, and we're trying to deal with you know cardiac arrest, we'll get right. any officers. We're not always able to look at the 
um, computer or the video monitor and in an emergency, five minutes to like click, we won't even notice. To all your dispatch entities, is this a universal system, or do you have stuff that's cobbled together that's being that your 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 sending unit can reach them all? But they're not. Are they all compatible systems? Yes, they okay. are all compatible. Um, the one of them uses radio waves, the other one uses copper wire, telephone wire. Um, so we'd like to get them all on the same page, and not not only that, but system coverage. There's right. spot, there's dead spots the police department have that the fire departments don't have any issues with and, and vice versa. So let's get our full coverage for all of our responders to keep them safe. And also we can piggyback the GPW on it and replace all their antiquated right. radio systems. And I think that if we come forward as a collaborative group, then we're gonna have a little bit more power. It's not just benefiting one department, it's benefiting everybody. Right. Um, so that's one of the issues that we're dealing with. The, re the radio refresh really is going to be a band-aid until we do something better. I mean, it's like upgrading your laptop as opposed to buying a brand new one. Um, but it's it's a Band-Aid that we can manage right now money-wise. Like I said, my grant will cover it, and what doesn't get covered, the, the funds that I take in for monitoring firearms will cover the rest. Um, so the other thing, part of this working group is looking at a CAD vendor for the fire department. The current system, that's our computer-aided dispatch, the current system, they can't, um, get any in, any useful information out of it. They can do reports, but they end up working with three separate systems to do one report. It's just super cumbersome for them. So we're, that's something else that we're going to be focusing on is, is there a better software system out there that would work for them? Um, Central Services is looking at replacing our bulletproof windows, which is exciting because we haven't been able to see out of them for about four years now. Oh, well, the Lexan's gone foggy. Yep, okay. exactly. Um, and I've offered whatever money, I don't know how much the quote will, will be for David Pomerantz, but I can also put in some funds towards that. It's the nice thing about having that firearm monitoring fund. Yeah. It's revenue stream, we call it. Yes, yes, the revenue stream. Um, we're, we are at full staffing, have been at full staffing for over a year now, which is fantastic. Um, it's so hard to keep our staff there, but since we've had that, um, the pay raise, the um, regrading of our conditions, I don't know what it's called, but that's been able to help me keep staff there because they're being paid what, competitively what they should be paid. So that's been fantastic. So we have dispatchers that have experience and knowledge and know the city and get to know the responders, which is really important. Um, so we did get my grants again this year from the state 911 department. I'll be having that, about $92,000 for support incentive, which is going to cover that radio refresh. It also covers salaries, so it helps my budget that way. We'll have $17,000 for training, um, which is fantastic. Again, it's hard to use it all. Um, but one of the things that I'm looking at, there's a new company in Canada. And I don't know how new they are, but they deal a lot with motivating your employees as opposed to just throwing information at them. Get them involved in this information and get, get buy-in from them. So they're actually learning it, not just attending a class and for a certificate. Um, one of the things that I really want to focus on is right now we're seeing some PTSD with our dispatchers just from handling calls over time and just the added stress that one event will just come make it all come crashing down and it's not usually an event that should be something that is that big issue. I have one dispatcher that just worked a major storm and she's not been able to recover. She's just been so stressed out. So I'd like to focus more on the health and well-being of the dispatchers. They have all the tools to do the job. They know how to handle domestic violence calls. They know how to handle hazmat, but how do they take care of themselves and how do we recognize this? Because I want to keep my employees long term. You know, we're starting to see this as a profession. It's not just a job. People are going to be in it for a long time. We need to take care of their mental well-being as well. So that's that company out of Canada has a couple of classes that focus specifically on that. Um, and then lastly, we're collaborating with the police department um, for mutual aid. We, a couple things have come up about what happens if we have a major event and we have five communities come in. Well, how, how does interoperability work? How are we going to talk to them? And then so we've reached out some other, to some other departments. They're like, yeah, I, I have no idea how that would work. So um, Captain Casper and myself are going to be meeting with representatives from East Hampton and Amherst to kind of hash out what is it, what's our goal, what's our mission, what do we want to focus on? And then we would like to eventually open it up Hampshire County and Franklin County and have some kind of training where um, each officer is trained in it and we'll be doing drills. 
So I'd like to look at getting some funding from Department of Homeland Security to fund that as well. So we're just trying to trying to think outside of ourselves that it's not just about one single department, but let's bring a bunch of people together and make it overall a better system. And that's all I have. Well, thank you. Oh, wow. Ten minutes. Just ask well, I was interrupting, so it's my bad. <laughs> uh -huh. But there may be some other questions from Councilor or Councilor More comment. I'm, I'm actually glad to see that you're proactive in this. I think that yeah. there's the tendency is to go along, get along, and and then of course a lot of pressures, uh, uh, financial pressures being not the least of them, that kind of create situations that create some creative responses but ultimately don't lead to uh, the, the optimal functioning system and I'm glad to see that you actually have the, the means to look beyond that and I'm, that's encouraging. I, I, th I absolutely agree with you. I think that um, given the tendency for the technology to far outstrip, uh, well I mean it changes every day of course, but the fact is, is if you, you know, find a comprehensive system that's secure and fully functional clearly has advantages that most folks don't see from the outside. Right. Obviously, they don't manifest. It's all you know. It's all the people you're toning out are the ones who are, who are and, and everyone in your office and your mm -hmm. shop dealing with the issues. This this the the cat issue is actually kind of concerning. The fact that you you basically have to. Uh, it'd be great if it could you could just simply pull from the system. Your reporting, and right. that you don't need to jerry rig it and cobble it together. That's that's a lot of extra work mm -hmm. on reporting that ultimately gives more opportunity for failure. I think so. Yeah, good on you for that too. So and it's you know we're putting in good information, but we can't ever pull it out. They, right. The response times are almost impossible to find out. They're not as accurate as they could be. Um, and I think that complacency in this position is just our biggest enemy. If we're going right. to be complacent and not move forward with technology and taking care of our people, then why are we even here? Right, well, and it's also, I mean, what you're suggesting and I'm hearing is that if we don't, if we can't take advantage of the data that we can analyze, that would actually improve services and, and, and the efficacy and also enhance efficacy, then that's we're actually we might as well go back to tin cans and string. Mm -hmm. We want to do that. So, right. Carson, any uh, comments? Okay, if you'll bear with me, I think we'll just take this opportunity to note um, for the public that obviously this is being audio and video recorded. I don't believe there was any public comment from the gallery. So I will ask then if we can take the number five item on the agenda, which was the I, approval of minutes. I move that we accept the minutes from the last meeting. And I second that. Okay, uh, moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Okay, aye. Then those minutes are accepted and approved. And I'll defer again to Chief Dunn. Okay, I think we're gonna let Kelly go since she has a time over there. And Thank you for your Kelly? presentation. Uh, in terms of uh, fire rescue, I'll uh, pass out a quick overview here. Okay. 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 That represents the end of about a four-month process to select new people as we've had vacancies, we've had a couple of retirements, someone going into the Navy, a couple of other people going to different departments, which is sort of always a challenge that I think people come to us and they get their feet wet in many cases and then go to other departments more and more. Um, I think some of that is an age dynamic. Uh, and Dwayne and I sort of scratch our head over that every once in a while. But um, So we did have four start today and also the reserve firefighter. The, the benefit that that gives us is the ability to, once that person is trained, when the next opening occurs, immediately assign that person to a shift, not have to go through another process, not have to wait and incur overtime, and so forth. And with these four hires, as soon as they go on shift, that will help us control overtime. 
if, if we look at overtime, I mean, it's always been something I think we've caught collectively as a committee of, of concern. Uh, and it's something that we've done fairly well in controlling. If we have openings, um, there's sort of a happy medium between how many people we have and how many openings we fill. And we always try and balance that uh, and sort of move people around to maximum efficiency. But we found that to really be efficient, we need, in addition to the minimum staffing, about two people above that. So that the first two positions of someone on vacation or out sick or injured or whatever is not being filled with overtime. And this would restore us to that level. Uh, and prior to that and this year, we've had sort of the openings that you have the base salary there that can contribute, but it doesn't fully cover our costs. So uh, we're looking to get in line with that. Yeah, um, we discovered with police, you know, it's almost like you got to hire two ahead all the time because between right. between people transferring other places and 12-week parental leave, you, you know, in young departments, people are always having kids and going on leave. It's true. Yeah. Police is the same way. Yeah, I mean, Chief Sinkowitz and I have talked, it, and it's a constant challenge of both departments to maintain the high level of staffing that then controls that over time. At least the state doesn't have a fire service, so they're not stealing your guys. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, moving on into incident overview, I, I think I just wanted to flag for you three incidents. I'm sure you, you've probably heard uh, about these. One was a uh, fire on North Farms Road, which was struck by lightning, uh, caused about $2 million in damage. Uh, we actually fought the fire. It was well out of the water district. Uh, we, we tried to do some sort of innovative things from the Leeds high pressure water system into the low pressure water system, and that really didn't work out that well. So it was really a tanker shuttle operation that moved over a quarter million gallons of water to fight the fire. And the house was struck by lightning about seven or eight o'clock at night and we got the call at three in the morning, someone at the base of the mountain looking up uh, and seeing flames coming through the roof. So there, there certainly wasn't a whole lot that could be done at that point uh, other than just to control what was there. Uh, but uh, with that, we also found that the house was in Williamsburg. Uh, after the fact, the driveways in Northampton, the houses. In Most of Williamsburg's out of our water district. Isn't it? Right. <laughs> uh, secondly, we had a second alarm fire on Main Street in Leeds uh, about a week and a half, two weeks ago. Uh, so that uh, took uh, an intensive interior firefight with a balloon frame uh, house with a lot of hidden fire, and our people did an excellent job. Uh, I don't know if you saw the paper, but one of the things was the air bottles lined up and, and Assistant Chief Nichols had commanded that fire. It was just a lot of intensive effort in that regard. Uh, and then finally, uh, on the Haydenville Leeds line, uh, a week ago, Saturday, we had uh, a tragic accident that took the, the life of one of our captain's sons. Uh, and, and our people ended up sort of helping and managing the extrication and uh, really treating the patient as well. And, they had no idea who it was, uh, and we're sort of really saddened to find that out. So, so those are sort of the, the three major incidents. Uh, I'm going to ask Assistant Chief Nichols to talk about the change in the fire code. We're getting a whole new fire code, which adds a lot of responsibility and so forth. Yeah, the state, uh, as a general person, transitioning to a new state fire code. Uh, basically, they're adopting kind of the national standard out there, which is NFPA 1, they call it. Uh, they will have mass amendments to it. They have it published kind of for comment right now. I've taken a look through it. it. It really gives us a lot more definition and explanation on stuff where the old fire code kind of lacks some of that. Uh, but it, it's a pretty comprehensive code, code out there. Uh, training it has begun in the state uh, now through December, and uh, we'll get our people out to that training. The full effect of how it will impact the department, I'm not sure. Uh, just looking at some of the increased responsibilities uh, is certainly going to take some more man hours to be able to uh, get the required inspections done and permits issued out through there. So I, I don't know the full impact right now uh, set for next month to go through the update class on that and I'll have a better handle at that point. What, what, what the, can you give us some sense what the fire code covers to the extent that, I mean, would there, the significant changes mean it, it's significant really a, implementation? That yeah, it's really a lot more definition in that. Uh, it it kind of certainly will go from a, a small document to a larger document that's out there. But it'll give us more ability to define uh, what our responsibilities are going in for issuing permits, uh, for doing inspections, and, and that type of... Uh, okay, so it's more about... That's what, that's what I was wondering, and it, it's, it's less about uh, how you guys prosecute a fire 
and, oh, and yeah. more and more about how you implement yeah. uh, code and yeah. standards and universal standards of, of, of fire safety. Yeah, yeah. Okay. A, a few years ago, they, they adopted the, the building code side. But right. They went to kind of the national standard out there. This kind of is the fire size following with that trend out there because uh, there was always some complications between the two codes just because of different documents. Right. Uh, the goal is, is to try to bring them together and, and at least have them work uh, hand in hand as they go forward. Uh, and, and like I say, it should give us a lot more definitions as far as inspections and you know, get into what's required for systems and stuff like that. Uh, and permits, uh, you know, how they should, how flammable should be stored and uh, what's needed for, you know, proper applications of that. So it'll, it'll give us a lot more with that. It's certainly a larger document. And it'll be interesting to see. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to see what the impact is as far as man hours and stuff. Well, uh, once right. you figure that out, you can tell the state, right? And then they'll send us a check. On yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure they <laughs> That's always the case. They're yeah. Very responsive to I mean, I, from, from the fire prevention side, I, I think it's a good thing. It, it will give us that more clarity, I'd say, and, and uh, definition, you know, so it's not interpretation that we're doing. It will give us a more in depth ability to truly understand what is the intent of the code. Uh, but I just took a quick look through it uh, in the last month or so and just seeing uh, a lot more work uh, out there as far as issuing the permits and things like that. So uh, I'm, I'm curious to really get into it, get working with it and see what the impact is. I mean, I think for the community, the, the ultimate goal is to have a safe community and, and a safe place out there. Uh, but I think there's gonna be some added workloads that you know, we're gonna have to juggle and try to manage. But what I see is fire prevention is really becoming a technical specialty. So years ago, uh, we could have uh, a fire prevention officer and then every shift would do some inspections. And the captains would go out in the engine companies and do the, the simpler inspections. Now even those simpler inspections have evolved that it's not just placing a smoke detector, it's evaluating the smoke detectors at the right type, is it the right date? Does it, does it have carbon monoxide detection? And we're finding that even though we provide the training, there are different levels of competence and interpretation between people to the point that and really- town to town. I see that, you know, it isn't the code, it's the code in Holyoke, and it's the code yeah. in Amherst, and it's the code in Northampton, you know. Everybody's right. interpretation is a little bit different. So, so more and more it is becoming really a specialty, and this will bring it one step further that will increase sort of the workload, not, well, the department as a whole, but specifically under Dwayne Irving and Fire Prevention. And, and that's just something we need to watch over time. Do you see a national trend towards focusing more on prevention and less on response? Or is, uh, I mean, I, I'm guessing, but I always assume that fire fighting was just that. It was firefighting was implementation of response as opposed to um, with a, a little sideline of fire prevention. But the, the, the trend nationally, I think, over the last 30 years has been, you know, try to prevent the fire before right. it happens is, is the ideal way to go. That's been very effective. And, and right. I think yeah. it has. It's shown nationally as fires are down right. uh, and, and decrease uh, is there. So it's proven to be effective. Uh, I, I like to say that fire prevention isn't sexy. Right. It isn't flashy. It's right. you know, kind of common yeah. sense and good housekeeping <clears throat> and, you know, proper storage. It saves your life. It, mm -hmm. it, it will absolutely and, save your life. And, and I mean, it was, you know, when you said it's integrated with the building code now, I mean, luckily you don't run into any more balloon frame buildings, you know, right. except the existing ones. So there's little things yeah. in the building code that may not only buildings safer, but if they do catch yeah. fire, make it safer for you guys yeah. trying to put them out. And one of the hard things with fire prevention is to quantify right. what you've done. Always the case. And, you, and can't, you can't quantify. You, you can quantify response. You can't quantify. Mm -hmm. yep. You can't quantify what you prevented. It, it would be immediate, proving a negative. Yeah. If we could put, you know, if you could somehow say that by doing this action and, and taking this uh, to be able to put a dollar figure on that prevented fire, but right. there's no way to be able to do yeah. that. They're not going to make movies and TV shows about fire prevention. No. <laughs> no exactly. Making about fire. The response. fire that didn't happen. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. exactly. Well, We're inspecting a smoke detector is not quite as sexy. Yeah. But even with smoke detectors, I mean. You know, can you, I, we probably can't think of a fire chief's tenure in Northampton that's had as few fire deaths as yours, you have, right. simply because mm -hmm. the whole time you've been here, there's been smoke detectors. Yep. And I mean, it's, yeah. you can tell. I mean, there's, they're tragic when they happen, but not like they right. used to. Yeah, I would, I would go back to the last, I'm thinking, four major fires, larger fires we've had in the city, and they've been set fires. 
and they've been carrying right. disposable smoking materials and natural causes. So to me, from in charge of fire prevention, that's that's a good thing because I can't control any of those. Right. Um, and uh, it, it just I think signifies of where fire prevention is coming, where it's going. Uh, that we're I like to think we're doing good things out there, and uh, we're, we're making a safer community for everyone. But, but certainly, I think this was the first year I, I sat in front of the Finance Committee and said, geez, fires are, are dramatically down across the country, and, and it really is becoming a national trend. And uh, even with the charter change, the, the organization is officially being renamed Northampton Fire, Fire Rescue. Rescue. So yeah. that speaks to not only sort of the value of fire prevention and where we're going, but the focus on other things, uh, hazmat response, uh, some of your uh, unique hazmats with the drugs and so forth that we're seeing, expanded emergency medical services where we're certainly the leader. And I asked Daryl to come in tonight and talk about a new program we're focusing on, which is technical rescue, which I think right now we're the leader in the state in this area for using technical rescue resources. Um, so before we move off of Dwayne, I also wanted him to talk just about injury uh, sort of statistics and give you an overview of the last couple of years in terms of injuries. Always another wonderful topic. So I, I did a summary because uh, I was interested uh, where, where I kind of managed the injured on duty claims and status for the department along with uh, Linda and HR. And uh, looking at FY12 and FY13, we had 25 uh, total claims within those, that two year period out through there. And kind of the breakdown was where I was interested because certainly trying to prevent injuries out there. We, we had six dur during training, uh, five exposures during patient care, and four injuries uh, occurring in the fire scene, four other injuries occurring lifting patients, and five other injuries occurring around the station. So really, really what I was looking at, I think when you break it down, is kind of a, a health and wellness program. Or what, how can we prevent these things and where we can go? Does something stand out? Uh, well, yeah. well, an interesting thing that stood right out was looking at the dates when I kind of broke them all down was, uh, you know, about a year ago, we put in the power lift systems in the ambulances. And uh, before that, uh, I had four injuries occur lifting patients. Since we put those in, we've had zero. So I, I think that's a direct result of, uh, you know, getting the power stretchers and the power lift systems for the ambulances is a huge thing. Uh, I think, you know, money well spent keeping people here. Uh, you know, the exposures and, and uh, you know, the needle sticks and fluids and things like that, I, I think that's something we could address and work forward. And it's, again, it's probably a, a wellness, health, and safety program for the department, uh, which would be kind of neat to, you know, get some members involved and, and try to look at them and analyze of what can we do uh, to try to eliminate these or at least reduce them out through there. So it, it was interesting. I mean, that was the, the clear thing was the power of systems were, were certainly a win well spent for the city uh, to take care of there. And on the other ones, I'm, I'm working around those, uh, you know, injuries around the station. Uh, we're certainly always looking at that of, you know, good housekeeping abilities and, and keeping things clean and, and taking care of that stuff. So it's an ongoing process, but I hadn't done that uh, where I worked with Joe Cook to be able to get those reports out. And uh, so just a neat thing I think we can go forward to try to manage and reflect on what happened and how can we eliminate it or, you know, certainly be used to possibilities of that. Yeah, but they seem to be kind of evenly distributed, nothing standing out as being no, extra nothing, treacherous. Yeah, no, nothing standing out. I mean, you know, things are going to happen on the fire ground because it's dynamic. Uh, and I think patient care, it's dynamic too. It, it's certainly an emergency scene and, and, you know, guys are doing what they need to do to, for patient care and taking care of that. Uh, I, I think around the station, I'd love to reduce that. Uh, and then training injuries, I'd love to really take a look at that and say, all right, well, what can we do to try to keep our people safe and, and healthy. And, and I too get the takeaway of it's the positive of what we didn't see, um, which we would have seen years ago. And uh, we had a couple of back injuries when we first started, much like many fire departments and EMS services that were several hundred thousand dollars and ultimately resulted in people being retired. We're not seeing that anymore based on the technology. Given your injuries, I mean, what, what's the time lost? from those injuries? Are they, uh, you I know, mean, somebody's out a week? Is it somebody out the, months? The, the average is usually, a, it's about two shifts uh, is oh, the average. Uh, one. You know, we got the long term. Uh, we have one member who's been on ILD uh, about two years. Uh, he's on light duty status right now, going through the retirement process. Uh, 
Uh, I got another member who's been out six months, uh, should be returning in a couple of weeks to the department with a knee injury. So th those are the extremes, but normally it's, it's you know, a couple of shifts and uh, we're fortunate to get them back to work. Yeah. But it's those long-term ones that I think it's hard to put the, the dollar value on uh, because I, I calculated just for those two years, we had uh, $81,000 in medical expenses, but that doesn't take into account the uh, overtime and coverage of shifts that we needed to do. So, uh, you know, I think a great goal is to try to reduce that and hopefully eliminate the medical expenses and IE, you know, I didn't do the, the overtime expense, but certainly bring that back down. And, and that also reflects what Kelly talked about, is we're really trying to sort of delve into some of the data and, and pull things from the data to, to be proactive, so uh, to the extent we can. And, and she mentioned that the, the CAD system we have is very difficult uh, to extract things. We actually had to have um, the intern from or to our call, the Collins Center walk through the process using uh, an access database, an Excel spreadsheet, and our system. Was that the city staff stuff? Yeah. 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 So now we're trying to sort of look at where technology has come and, and see if we can short circuit that a little bit. But, uh, but this is an example of some of the data that we, we may be able to get out of something in the longer term, how we're trying to harvest that. Um, let's see, moving on, three grants to uh, talk about. Uh, the first one is uh, a Fire Act grant to sprinkle uh, the substations of Florence Station. Uh, this was an initiative brought forward to the mayor by Deputy Norris and something he held near and dear to his heart of, if we're going out and saying, gee, in high hazard occupancy there should be sprinklers, why aren't we protecting our people with sprinklers and, and why do we have millions of dollars of equipment unprotected by sprinklers? And the federal government saw that and uh, he's now managing that project with central services. Uh, the second one came out of sort of the resiliency program, looking at uh, how, how do we uh, adapt and overcome in the event of long-term power outages uh, and you know redundant systems. So if our diesel generator failed and if the power is out, how could we function as a critical facility? And that's going to be a solar battery combination that came out of a, a state grant there. And, and finally, a $5,000 grant with the, the capital money that was provided last year for the purchase of a hybrid electric vehicle uh, through Chris Mason, we were awarded that. So that helps offset some of the costs a little bit too. So you talking about a solar array on uh, downtown station or both headquarters stations? Headquarters in the parking lot. Yeah. So, and that would ultimately feed batteries. I assume it would also feed back into the grid to it would go back electric bill. It would probably go part of the aggregate uh, 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 energy that we're generating from all our solar arrays, so whatever you don't need, we actually get as an offset. Right, right. So, uh, and if we construct it right, hopefully it will be an advantage in the snow as well. So. Park <laughs> to park underneath. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it'll be interesting. <coughs> to see, I'm, I'm real curious because with the copper roof, they could put solar panels on that. Uh, well, there, the, there are systems that you can actually use almost like parking structures with protective mm -hmm. parking structures. You can park under the array, and the array mm -hmm. uh, serves as a roof, but at the same time provides you the. The consultant Chris generation. brought out. We, we did a survey in the station, and uh, you know you, they were telling me about that. So I'm real curious of how we can construct that over the parking yeah. area and how mm -hmm. it will function, mm -hmm. uh, and how we still can maintain and do our work that we need to. Do. I, I think it's a doable thing. So that's true. I mean, you've got to, you have to maneuver vehicles that are a little bit larger than most yeah. folks. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I mean, for underemployed parking, it shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, I, I'd yeah. like to say, I'm, I'm real curious yeah. how it works. It, it should be pretty cool, I think. Sure, be nice after an overnight shift, not that, to scrape your windshield. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. So, so moving on, um, as I said, the, the fire service is really expanding into that rescue orientation. Uh, Daryl and John Garrafi are on the, the Western Mass Technical Rescue Team as our representatives. And we also host one of the trailers. Uh, it's a program that we've been very supportive of, although I never imagined putting them on that both would become basically leaders of the whole initiative. Uh, and Daryl and John have both sort of risen through the ranks to the point that I think Daryl is really running the entire thing. Uh, and I've asked them to come in and give you a sort of a brief overview of the team and sort of the benefits that are offered to the city. The last one of those I remember, was there, didn't you guys do one at the hospital? Uh, there we one did. A rope, uh, a rope rescue up yeah. Yeah. Scaffolding uh, at the uh, hospital. The last one. And we've had lately a lot of mountain rescues. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems that 
Uh, they've been up in Greenfield dealing with the French King Bridge. Uh, they've been doing recovery uh, of, what was it, up in Shelburne? Just one more, we won't get to And then uh, several mountain rescues around here. And, and it's one of those things that if, if we tried to do it ourselves, uh, we'd never be able to afford it. But working with others, we offer them assistance, they offer us assistance, and it's really a good program. Daryl, take it away. Um, so the, right after that incident we had at Cooley Dickinson, I think I spoke to you guys, uh, some of you were here. Um, and basically what I was bringing up was uh, we did that rescue with equipment that we had in the storage room at the fire station. However, we weren't really fully prepared to do a high angle rescue at that time. And I think I was advising you guys of that uh, when I came to you guys uh, shortly after that incident. As well as we have some other high hazard um, areas in the city, including water towers, the Coolidge Bridge, um, open water, things like this. Um, at one point, I did uh, attempt to obtain a AFG grant for the city of Northampton, uh, assistance of firefighters grant to purchase some more rescue equipment to outfit our department with some equipment, some training. Uh, that got denied at the local level. <coughs> Uh, the chief um, uh, allowed myself and one other member of our department to train with the Amherst Fire Department who had a technical rescue team who had some equipment and we were kind of sharing some resources back and forth with Amherst. After being on that team for um, a number of years we realized that team was also limited. They were out of money. They uh, basically, the city of Amherst was buying their equipment and basically they were uh, not able to purchase uh, a lot of new equipment, they weren't able to expand their, their cash equipment. So we got together with a number of other communities. <clears throat> uh, we talked about what our needs were in the area. We um, talked to the Western Mass Fire Chiefs. We've identified that there is an issue with Western Massachusetts with technical rescue. There's limited equipment, limited training, limited uh, personnel that train together. Um, so we came up with this idea of regionalizing technical rescue, which is something they're doing out east. Um, probably about eight years ago, they started um, really ramping up their technical rescue out east, and we kind of didn't catch on uh, out here in the west. So we uh, had a, a number of meetings over the course of three or four years uh, before we finally uh, received our first grant. Um, so I'm just going to briefly talk. You guys can flip if you want, or you don't have to. But uh, basically, the city of uh, Northampton, the fire department, we do have some capabilities as far as technical rescue. Obviously, vehicle extrication, we've always been on top of in the city. We have a number of uh, jaws of life. Uh, we do use them. We are very well trained in them. Uh, we also have high pressure airbags. We have some life safety rope that we can use for some rescue. Uh, we're limited as to our equipment on that, but we have an, enough capability to uh, make something safe. We can use an assessment. <clears throat> uh, we carry uh, um, some cribbing for stabilization. Uh, we do have some utility rope, which can't be used for life safety, but it can be used to secure um, other items. And we do have a number of uh, gas meters, which is important when we talk about confined space issues. Um, <clears throat> we do have training out, education, scene size up of technical incidents, uh, stabilization, slope evacuations, which would not be a high angle rescue, but would be more of a um, steep slope rescue where the risk of injury is a lot lower to the rescuers. <clears throat> so our members are trained in slope evacuations. We do have equipment for that. Um, and obviously we are trained in air monitoring. Um, where we run into trouble is the amount of training needed to get into the technical side of things. We talk about actual confined space and hazardous locations, uh, trench rescues, uh, digging in the ground, um, high angle rescues, the amount of equipment you need, the amount of trained people you need to actually operate the rope lines. Um, building collapse. Um, this, these are things that have specialized equipment that uh, they're just unreachable by, by our, our funding that we have. Uh, so we were able to um, put together this team, secure some funding. We've sent, uh, we have 80 members on the team right now. It covers all of Western Massachusetts, which includes Hamden, Hampshire, Franklin, and Berkshire counties. So 80 members cover 101 towns and cities. <clears throat> we're the largest geographical team in the state, and we're also the uh, largest number of uh, trained personnel on the team in the whole state. That being said, we also have police least funding. <laughs> but we've managed very well with uh, Homeland Security grants. Uh, we have some private donations, um, as well as the cities and towns have been sponsoring people to uh, be on the team. So I do, uh, I am allowed to go to the trainings and allowed to, uh, to go to incidents uh, from the city of Northampton. Um, 
where we're going with that is the uh, the team is fully operational now in rope rescue and confined space rescue. And this is something that within the city of Northampton, again, we were able to do slope evacuation, but we really weren't prepared for high angle rescue or uh, entry confined space rescue. We could maybe do a rescue from the outside of the confined space, <clears throat> but we didn't have the proper equipment or training to, to go inside confined space. So for Northampton to provide that would be very expensive. This is a regional thing. We have a cache of equipment, uh, three caches of equipment actually, that benefits the city of Northampton. Um, <clears throat> same thing with trench rescue. The uh, amount of equipment, the weight of the equipment, the cost of the equipment is just unreachable. Again, we're going to have two caches of trench rescue equipment in Western Massachusetts that's going to be available to the city of Northampton, as well as the 80 team members. Um, the uh, structural collapse, we haven't uh, received funding for structural collapse yet. Uh, right now, I don't believe any of the teams in Western Massachusetts are have any training or equipment for structural collapse, which we realized shortly after the tornado that hit uh, Springfield and West Springfield. Um, they did call the Amherst team over to that incident, um, basically as advisors and to do what they could do with the, the training that they had. <clears throat> so we are on top of that, that's on our next uh, um, items that the team will be covering is getting this structural collapse. So we do have a team that can respond readily available in Western Massachusetts. Um, the team is actually made up of so many different uh, departments that we needed an organization to be in charge. So the Western Mass Fire Chiefs Association took on that responsibility. So even though Northampton sends me to uh, an incident, uh, Northampton may not be in charge of that incident. I'm working for the Western Mass Fire Chiefs Association or underneath the umbrella of the Western Mass Fire Chiefs Association. So we have a hierarchy of the team. We have a, a way to um, pass information up and down to all the chiefs in all of Western Massachusetts, and we do have um, they do have control of the team. Um, <clears throat> we have three caches of equipment. Um, we have three trailers that we bought in the grant approximately two years ago now. We've only been operational since this past January, so a little less than a year. Um, we took us about a year to get the equipment. Everybody trained on the equipment to do the mandatory uh, training in each discipline up to the technician level. Um, one cache of equipment is actually right here in Northampton. Uh, the chiefs uh, allowed us to, to carry one of the, uh, the trailers here. <clears throat> and the trailer in Northampton um, is basically the same as there's one in Pittsfield and there's one in Holyoke. As far as rope rescue stuff, the trailers are nearly the same. We have the same amount of rope, the same equipment. Everything is set up exactly the same way. So I could go to an incident at Pittsfield and uh, know right where something is on that trailer because it's exactly the same as this Northampton. Um, the Northampton trailer has a few advantages that the other trailers don't. We have a couple of 600 foot ropes, which is not very common in rope rescue, but we identified a need for that in this particular area between Franklin County and Hampshire County, and also Northampton is kind of centrally located. So if those long ropes are needed, they can be readily available. <clears throat> the trailer in Holyoke is uh, heavy on uh, confined space equipment. Obviously, being a more industrial type setting down there, uh, we thought that that would be a hot spot for confined space issues. So we've outfitted that trailer with extra confined space equipment. We have enough in Northampton to be able to set up and get started, but the bulk of it's going to be in Holyoke. Um, same thing with the Pittsfield trailer. They actually have had a few issues with trenches collapsing in that area, so they're heavy on trench rescue equipment. They're going to be heavy on trench rescue equipment. Um, they're going to have the bulk of that, even though we are going to have some on each of the other trailers to end up getting started. Um, so there's uh, 80 people on Hampshire, Franklin County are one division. Berkshire uh, County is one division, and Hamden County is one division. In the Hampshire, Franklin County, which is where we are, there's uh, 21 members on a team in that district. So if an incident was to happen in Northampton today, um, the call would go out, and those 21 people persons would get notified first to respond to the scene. On an average, we're getting about a 50% uh, uh, return on when we page something out. So if 21 people on a team, we'll probably get 10 or 11 uh, people to actually respond directly to the incident. Um, if the incident's uh, larger than that, or we need more people, we reach out to another division, they respond uh, from either Hamden County or Berkshire County. We basically can go right across the state to the other teams and have an unlimited supply of uh, personnel and equipment. Um, 
this has all been brought <clears throat> up not only from a uh, firefighter standpoint where we wanted to get some more training and more equipment, but also the um, Fire Chiefs Association of Massachusetts has been meeting about this since about 2008 when they realized that there was a need for that in Massachusetts. Um, so they've been working on the Chiefs end uh, politically and they actually put together some draft legislation in the hopes of obtaining a line item budget in the Department of Fire Services to actually pay for a technical rescue across the entire state. That has not happened yet. That's still in the works. <clears throat> uh, but that's just one of the future uh, possibilities for, for funding the team. Um, we're fortunate to receive the grants that we've gotten so far, but we know that's going to dry up eventually and we need a way to uh, fund it in the future. So that's one of the things we're working on. Um, for funding. Uh, the other thing we're working on for funding is other grants, um, private donations, and also uh, the team um, has been hired out to do details, and any money from that has been going into the uh, Western Mass Fire Chiefs as an account set up for the team uh, in the hopes that eventually, uh, if we do do details, that account would build up, and if we had an incident, the city and town that sends the person to that incident could get reimbursed for the cost of sending that person. Um, again, we're a new team, that still hasn't happened yet. We're trying to um, build, build up to that funding. Um, since uh, we've gone live in January, I believe we've been requested seven times and we've responded to five separate incidents as a team. Um, all of those have been at the entry of Brickman County. We haven't had any in Hamden County or uh, Berkshire County yet. So you can see the need <laughs> is right here. Uh, again, we're the, we're the part of the responses we've had so far. And those have uh, all been for high angle equipment. And basically, when we res responded to these incidents, the information we received is the local fire department or the local team that's already there is out of people and they're out of equipment. They can't go any further. That's what they're requesting us. So we have been used, it is a need. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you guys are interested in knowing about the team. Um, the cost for training, I mean clearly this is something you need to update as, as, as uh, training becomes more sophisticated and, and how is how you guys being a regional system? Are you going to rely on grants to subsidize your training? The, thus far, we've um, been able to secure grants for all our initial training in each discipline that we've um, gone to. For instance, trench rescue. We received a homeland security grant to send our members to trench rescue school. The con continuing training to train as a team, we are required to attend eight drills a month to maintain our status on the team. Currently, the local departments have been sending their members, and, and I don't believe have been reimbursed. Eight drills yet. a year. About okay. eight drills a year, not a month. Eight drills a year. So yeah. Eight drills a month would be a lot. Um, uh, so currently, each in the, the end, each individual department has been sending their people to be on this team. Uh, in the future, we hope to achieve uh, receive grants for initial training and new disciplines. Um, but again, moving forward to maintain the team and, and maintain eight drills a year, um, that's where we're going to have to look for other funding. That's where we're hoping the uh, legislation uh, will change or Department of Fire Services may fund this in the future. Uh, but a lot of that's still up in the air. But right now we're, we're operating, we're, we're doing really well with what we have, um, and we have uh, done very well with the grants. And, brought some of that equipment and money to Western Massachusetts. Well, I mean, because you're relatively new, you haven't had, you haven't experienced turnover, I would imagine, in any large fashion. That It's basically, I imagine everyone knows everyone's name on, on and so you guys are already good at working with each other. Eventually, as this, this becomes a legacy, there's going to be turnover and and transition and adaption so that they're going to have to be made. Sure, we, we've actually uh, started addressing that already. We initially started with 101 uh, uh, responders that wanted to be on the team. We were already down to about 80 or 81. Um, basically, 
we know that the people that are here now want to be here. Right. <laughs> um, and we've also, even though we've initially trained the whole team to the same standard, as new people come in to the team, we're going to ask them to already be at that standard. So if you want to uh, be on the team in the future, we're going to ask that you've already gone to the Mass Fire Academy, Rope Rescue School, the Trench Rescue School, and such. Um, so that'll take some of the burden off the sure. team. It'll introduce a new team member to the disciplines to really decide if they're, they're going to do it or not. Uh, we don't want to train somebody that's not going to say, this isn't for me. I can't go and take spaces. <laughs> so I'm claustrophobic. <laughs> right. So we, we, we were trying to address, uh, address that um, as best as we can. And uh, thus far, we've, we've done very well. So we're pretty happy with our personnel and the way things are going. And what started sort of the need in Northampton was we, we've had two or three incidents a year where either we have a slope evacuation right. or Councilor Murphy mentioned the, the uh, smokestack rescue off of the hospital. But every industry that has a confined space lists us as the responding agency. Right. Yet we had no equipment and no training to do that. And when we approached them, uh, actually Mayor Higgins got together sort of a round table of industry years ago and said, we're willing to do this, but you need to help us support us, and, and that's where the conversation stopped. So this was a way of coming up with that solution that we could actually do something. Uh, Mass DOT had that thing with the trailers where uh, someone was killed, actually, and, but of course rescuers didn't know what the status of the person was. In, in the, were you guys called into play on that one? That actually happened before the team was active. That sounded okay. Um, however, I believe that the Amherst team at that time had been called in uh, to do that. That would be an incident where you could activate this team for some special equipment or training, certainly. Well, I mean, I mean, clearly, the need, I mean, it, you know, uh, it, speaking as a layman, this is clearly something I always took for granted and never, I, you know, naturally presumed that you dial 911 and, and a fully equipped, fully trained crew is going to show up and make my my life better. And, um, and, and in fact, actually, this is you're right. In fact, actually, I think just in the news, there was someone with a sprained ankle it's pulled down off of Mount uh, Holyoke. Okay. Um, and that gets more and more common. Plus, Smith College has a tradition called Mountain Day, where they actually send you out into the mountains, theoretically. That, most of them don't go out of the mountains, but on the first nice day, lots of opportunity for slope rescues for you there, probably. There's all those hidden caves up on the side of the well, There's also the increased mountain bike issues, and people now actually getting out in the hills and in fact actually part of the challenge is to put yourself in the greatest amount of danger as possible and lots of it so I imagine opportunity starts to expand as the so, needs there. So. Yeah the, the big thing we need to have too is the equipment and not only do we use the equipment the incident on Skid Mountain about a week ago we did get activated for that 12 of our members responded we responded with our trailer we uh, not only outfitted our own members with equipment to go into the woods, but we also outfitted other firefighters that were there that were doing the rescue that weren't part of our team with some of our equipment to be able to use just because they didn't have that equipment really available. They did have a certain amount of equipment when we talk about the amount of manpower and personnel that went into those woods. Um, they didn't have enough to go around. So we did hand out some of our extra helmets, some of our extra lights and things like that um, to let the local department borrow to take in so yeah, who, who gets who gets a, who, where's the line of authority when you show up for a call like that and that's, uh, a, that's a good question the um the local department always has uh, jurisdiction yeah. so as a team we're coming in as a regional team if chief uh, duggan requests a team for northampton we are all reporting to right so you're responsive to right okay right. so sense. as a chain of command uh breaks out we would be put underneath a uh, a, you know, probably a chief officer is in charge of the rescue. So in so that I, case, was it Hadley for the Skinner? Or um, it started Hadley ended up being South Hadley. Okay. Yeah. Um, but that's a, a, a good question. We do we do as little or as much as the local department needs or wants. So we're there to assist. We're there to uh, provide whatever they need. Um, it's working out real well. All right. So let's see, moving on, um, we have two items left. I'm gonna ask uh, Chris to talk about sort of the state EMS inspection. Usually we have them run through all the 
the stats and numbers. We figured we'd save that for the next meeting, uh, but we just did have the state annual inspection. So. Yeah, the State Office of Emergency Medical Services was in two weeks ago um, for our annual inspection. They went through our five ambulances that are licensed at the paramedic level, as well as the three engines that are also licensed now at the paramedic level. Um, the inspection went um, exceptionally well. Um, you know, there's always room for improvement, no doubt. Um, they offered a few suggestions, um, but overall in terms of equipment supplies um, vehicles maintenance plans um, training and administrative policy procedures um, we're we're in a good position right now um, a couple of suggestions they did make we already put a plan of correction forward that's all been submitted um, so we're moving forward and uh, we're good for another year in the state size for, for the license um, other than that, I know the chief mentioned the four new people, the five new people that are coming on, so we're bringing them up to the orientation. And then the only other thing moving forward with EMS is last week the capital plan was submitted, and as part of that was a new ambulance. And with that, what we're looking at is we currently have a 2007 uh, GMC 4500 that going into this calendar year 2015 that will be coming up on 100,000 miles. Um, that was one of the first new GNCs we bought, and I, I know people here remember back when we did that public-private partnership, um, and one of the contracts we had with them, uh, one of the criteria was that no ambulances would have over 100,000 miles on it, just based on historical evidence that once they reached that um, mileage, they become problematic in terms of routine uh, maintenance and upkeep. Um, so we're looking to uh, within the next 12 to 18 months, hopefully that moves forward and uh, gets approved to get that replaced uh, from down the line. What are we doing with our reboxing? Didn't we come up with a so, so switching chassis? And based on what this committee asked, uh, what we've done is every other one, we're, we're phasing into that. So uh, I'm gonna hand up the capital plan next, but um, for next year it's new ambulance, then it's a re-chassis, then a new ambulance. So it would cycle through with the idea that each one would be re once and then surplus. And, and I think that the other thing that Chris didn't mention is the state inspector was really extremely pleased with our level of technology and equipment, the, the lift systems, the, the things that ambulance services don't commonly have. Uh, he was very impressed with that and certainly sees us as a leader in the area, not the state. Uh, and there was actually just uh, there's a sort of clipping service that sends out news articles. Uh, it, it came out that we were the first to put from EMS equipment on fire trucks. Well, what it was supposed to say is that we were the first in the state licensed as an emergency first response service to put paramedic equipment on fire trucks. Right, oh. right. Um, but just uh, as evidence of that leadership position. So, so with that segue, I will uh, pass out uh, sort of the last item which is just a capital plan that went in the other day. Uh, I'm sure Councilor Murphy will be sick of it. But starts tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, but this just gives you a perspective of sort of where we are and what some of the needs are uh, as we go forward. And, you know, some of the things, um, as we're reaching really 15 or 16 years and some of the uh, things that we bought, we're finding that they are obsolete. One, one of them is the breathing apparatus that we have. Uh, we did a significant upgrade when I first came here 16 years ago, and now we've been doing it sort of dribs and drabs, and the standard just changed last year. So we have uh, five or six doing compliant update packs. Do we buy five or six? Six. Six. So we have one unit basically outfitted with sort of the most up-to-date current standard packs. This project would span over three years to sort of bring the rest up so the first phase would be all of our current uh, on-duty staff. The second phase would be to build it out and round it out from there. But that, that's certainly a critical need in terms of safety and protection. Uh, and then we look at the command vehicle, the ambulance, and just doing a technology update on communications equipment. Uh, one of the things we found is all the portable radios that we've been buying are gonna be obsolete at the end of the year and no longer produced. So we need to transition, and of course, when you do that, it's take the $600 portable radio, and now it's an $1,800 portable radio. So uh, things are increasing in cost dramatically as well. 
So, but uh, just more than anything, I wanted to just share with the committee sort of a perspective on where we are in terms of projects and needs and uh, so forth, and uh, comment on we, we did dial in the ch re chassis versus replacement to uh, be efficient and save some money as well. So, fiscal year 2019 is what we've got to really be prepared for since that's the big items there, and uh, at least what you have is planned yep. in a planning phase. Right, and 2019 would absolutely have to do the turnout gear. Mm -hmm. um, the replacement of the tanker pumper, we actually bought the one we have now used as a band-aid yes. for three right. years. Right. Three, four years ago? Four years ago. Right. So it's past what we expected anyway, and now we're saying it's going to last another few. But okay. in terms of finances, it has to be sequenced in with some of our other priorities as well. And, and honestly, it's actually running pretty well right now. Great. So that was a good purchase. Are there any other questions from counselors on the plan submitted? No. Okay, no. if there are no other comments or questions, um, I'll ask, I'll uh, tell, uh, excuse the chief and the rest of the department. Thank you very much for your presentation today. Really yeah. informative and helpful. Thank you. And Thank I'll you ask guys. the other members if there's any other business to move forward. I'll move that we adjourn. Okay. Move to adjourn. Second. And seconded on debatable. All those in favor? Bye. Meeting adjourned at just 6.02. Thank you.